Anyway, I hope everybody is uh, caffeinated. I'm still a little uncaffeinated, so if I'm a little slow, that's why, and I apologize ahead of time. Um, that's me over there with my first engineering project. As you can see, I was making those mountains in the background. <laughs> Um, a little bit about me, uh, you can get, get a hold of me at Joe Stump or Joe at stu.mp. Um, I want to talk about warring factions. I think everybody here probably can already think about what I'm talking about here, because most of us are working in product or product managers. The warring factions are the business and the makers. Um, I say this as a, as a recovering maker um, and someone that has built a lot of code and done a, and done a lot of uh, you know, it's done a lot of making. Uh, one of the frustrations that I always had being a party of this warring faction is I was kind of the weirdo that had the business degree but had been a hacker, so I understood what both people were complaining about. Um, and some of the things that always like really frustrated me is you, know, is you would literally go into, does anybody here have weekly kind of products and code meetings or something along those lines? I would assume everybody kind of has those, right? These meetings are amazing. Like they're amazing. Like a social, like a like a sociologist would like just love these things, right? You walk in and it's like makers on one side, there's business stakeholders on the other side, and then those poor PMs are in the middle at either end of the table mediating, right? It looks like a frickin' negotiation at the UN or something, right? This is what I, as a developer, I really hate. That, like the exchanges that happen here are meetings. And as a developer, the, what, what I always hated about this part right here is either this person, usually because this person's asking them in a meeting, comes to me, not in a meeting while I'm in the flow coding with my headphones on, which means don't come bug me. And then they come over to me and they're like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> and it's like, first of all, I just had this crazy spider web of code in my brain and that just all fell out. Now I gotta rebuild that. And then second of all, why are you asking me how, what I'm doing and how things are going? Every single bit that I push as a developer or a designer is being audited and tracked in this thing called source control management, right? It drives me insane. So, <laughs> and it's interesting because that actually happens both ways. So what'll happen the other way is the maker comes to the PM and is like, am I getting paid next week? And then the PM goes to the business stakeholder and is like, are we going to land that big deal next week? And then that has to be fed back through, right? And I think this is a fundamental problem that really the, the struggle is, is that there is a lack of transparency and, and communication happening. And a lot of times it's happening via these really terrible things that we call meetings. Uh, the first thing that you're going to have to do when you move to attempting to communicate better is you have to check your ego. You have to basically, <clears throat> you have to uh, remember that you know everybody in the company is in this together. Everybody has a right to know basic information about the company. Like you're you're giving me my my paycheck. I own stock in this company, and you're not going to let me ask questions about you know how deal flow is going in Salesforce. I've never understood this kind of everybody creating their little fiefdoms and then trying to defend it, and us PMs have to go through and like poke holes in the walls and try and get the information out. This is another one that really, really frustrates me in communication, is that, <clears throat> I put this up here, everyone in your company is capable of having a great idea. And the reason that I say that, and I think that one of the greatest examples possibly ever in business history up till now, is the Nike swoosh symbol, like that's a famous story, right? The Nike swoosh symbol was made by the executive assistant for like $45. Um, and I, ran, I used to run into this at DIG all the time, that the communication channels were so broken through product and the rest of the company that when someone had a great idea, it was like, it was a fart in the wind. Like, it, it didn't, none of it was being captured and distilled and kind of communicated across the organization. Um, another thing that I think that needs to be communicated is, is very much those, uh, I for, I'm sorry, I forget the, the woman that was running the yoga studio, she's, she had a great point, which is that everything has to map back to these three business things. And that's something I'm always pushing on both developers as technologists when they come to me and they're like, dude, web scale, Mongo, Node.js, oh, more acronyms nobody cares about. And I'm like, am I gonna make more money? Can I ship more product? And they're like, no, it just, I like, you know, the ASCII output's prettier, and I'm like, we're not gonna do that. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is a struggle that everybody in product, in the business, and, and to be frank, even in technology, struggle with. This is, this is a classic paradox. 
quickly, correctly, cheaply, pick two. And this is something that I think needs to be communicated every time we're having a decision, like that, that balancing act that uh, Mickey was talking about earlier, I think kind of feeds into this as well, right? Or as they say, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Um, <clears throat> another kind of form of communication that I don't think is, ca is, is leveraged nearly enough in business is failure. Larry Page says failure is useful. And I totally agree with that. Um, I was at a conference where Joey said, if you want to increase the innovation, you need to lower the cost of failure. And what I mean by that is that you need to allow the, the engineers to invest in automation and testing. If you can get your product and your makers failing faster and communicating that with product and the rest of the business, I guarantee it. I, I literally guarantee it. I will give you a money back guarantee of like free beers for a week that you will ship more product and you will ship it more quickly if you just allow them to get into a position where they can fail more quickly. And this is really, this is a, a, a probably a more long roundabout way of saying you need to shorten feedback loops. And people always tell you that. You need to shorten feedback loops. What does that mean? It means fail quickly, fastly, succeed quickly, fastly, right? Like just as much as this automation is telling your engineers and your product team whether things are failing or succeed, like failing, they can also tell you that they're succeeding quickly and then you can move on. Um, so why, you know, obviously it's all about this. Uh, continuous deployment allows you to ship code on commit. This is something that I don't understand why more product and business people aren't embracing wholeheartedly. Most product and business people will be like, well, I gotta, I gotta package these things up and then I can get my press pop and PR's like, well, I gotta do this because the Wall Street Journal isn't gonna write about this fiddly little thing I just pushed. I am much more of the opinion that my job and product is to deliver customer happiness as quickly and as efficiently as humanly possible. So how are your users and customers gonna feel if you're like, I had that feature fully baked and ready to ship two months ago and I just, I just waited. And then the customer's like, well, why, why? I lost like a lot of money because you didn't have that feature. And then you're like, well, because my PR person negotiated an embargo with TechCrunch, right? That's insane. It's insane that I, in my opinion, like that's insane. Um, and I think this is really important too. Automated testing allows for aggressive refactoring of confidence. There are a lot of times when features from product and product uh, and the business will come and it's like, I had this classic conversation with a designer one time at Dig where <clears throat> he brought this design to me and he was like, uh, I need to, this is what we want to do. And I was like, okay, well, 95% of this is, is all good, but um, if we want to implement this feature, it's going to take a lot of a pretty aggressive refactoring. We're going to have to tear apart really core pieces of the code, and that's going to be scary because, you know, we didn't have tests at the time. And he said, he goes, well, it would be easier if I made it purple. Um, so one of the things that automated testing and this kind of automation allows you to do is that you can literally rip apart your billing system and put it back together on something new and then run your test and it's like, oh, it also works, right? So pretty important, I think. Um, another thing that I always think, uh, when I think about product, I think that it's trench warfare. It's like, it's two steps forward, one step back. Three steps forward, two steps back. Um, and I think that that's important to remember because <clears throat> Products are either deep driven or feature driven. And what I mean by this is that so many people feel that, you know, and I think that they feel this way probably in war too. If I just plan everything perfectly, and if I tag everything perfectly, and I just follow my iteration planning, that it's just all gonna work out. That ain't how shit works, right? The reality is you either have a date that you need to nail because you have four partners that are launching with you and they all have operations that are lined up behind that. And you know what's gonna happen? The closer you get to that date, you're gonna be like, Really, I really would have liked to have had that feature, but the reality is it ain't gonna happen, right? Or they're feature driven. This is a little bit more classic when you're when you're kind of revamping or relaunching a product. And, and at the end of the day, all the planning in the world, if if your CEO or your customers or you know what or product or whatever, if there's one feature in there that is literally the crown jewel, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you wanted, that you had the embargoes lined up. It doesn't matter if, when engineering comes back to you, it's like, eh, we need another week. You're gonna be like, yeah, okay, you got another week. <laughs> um, this all leads me to something that I've been trying to kind of formulate an opinion around. Um, you know, a CEO, as someone said earlier, us founders are opinionated people. Um, 
I noticed that there's a shift happening, and it's a, I wrote a blog post recently called Visions of a Post-Agile World, and there's a change underfoot that's happening at companies that we all respect and believe in, um, and I've been noticing this a lot in my own work habits, I've been noticing it in other companies' work habits, and the common thread that I've been noticing is that these are companies that, you know, I, not to do my own horn, but we do get the occasional customer, it's like, how are you shipping all of this with four people? And I know that GitHub got a lot of that as well early on. Like, you've built an amazing product that, and how are you doing this with like four guys in a coffee shop, right? This is, in my opinion, this is how they're doing it. I think of maybe even a better name for it would be called like Chaos Monkey Development, possibly, something <laughs> along that. Or, or maybe Asynchronous Development. The, but this is the way that we develop, and <clears throat> this is the way that GitHub develops, this is the way that many, many people are, are, are developing. Um, which is the first, the first seizing moment for most product and, and, and business stakeholders, no sprints, no milestones, no dates, nothing. None of that's tracked. And we don't track that at all as friendly. Um, option number, you know, number two, I consider this now optional. I think at the end of the day, just if we go back and think about it, feature driven or date driven, it really doesn't matter what my velocity is, it doesn't matter how many points you're burning because we all know what's gonna happen at the end of the day. Uh, <clears throat> this is critical. Each developer, uh, keep your, your master branch or, or uh, the main line, whatever you guys call it, uh, clean, clean, always deployable and always clean. Each developer then works on an item to completion in a feature branch. So we branch for every ticket. Every single ticket that comes in gets a branch, no problem. Right? And Git and GitHub makes it very easy to kind of deal with pulling that back in. We then do pull requests to GitHub for, for review. So what I really love about this, these two in conjunction is this really minimizes your exposure to risk. If I know that every feature, every feature branch has no more than, and this is probably true in Sprintly, usually has no more than maybe two or 300 lines of code in it, that minimizes my risk a lot when I'm going, when I'm heading into integration and deployment later on. Um, and then, Going back to once you've invested heavily in your continuous deployment and automation, features are deployed upon approval by continuous uh, deployment. I even have a designer that does this. He cuts branches, he submits pull requests, he deploys, he looks at CI. And when you invest in automation to that point, what you're really doing is you're empowering everybody to basically commit things back to the product. So as, as much as you can lower that barrier to entry to people participating and contributing at a functional level, the better. <clears throat> so the things why I think this is bad, uh, better, uh, it shares reactive qualities of Kanban. Um, Velocity still allows you to do fairly reason, uh, reasonable capacity planning. In Kanban, they would call this like work in progress limits and whatnot. And this is the biggie. Features shift in real time as they're completed. From the time that I see a pull request and it's approved in Sprintly, it's on staging in less than 20 minutes, it's on production in less than five minutes after that. So I, it, when you get to that point, and, and trust me, you've never met a happier customer than when they email in in the morning and say, I found this bug, and literally 45 minutes later, you're like, no problem, we have a test, it's in production, you're all good. Like, that's a great way to deliver some customer happiness. <clears throat> Our tools are broken. This is something that I'm, I'm really starting to get even more and more passionate about. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a, I make a tool in this space, so I'm a little bit biased. But this is the problem that I see with knowledge-based workers moving forward. And this isn't just development, this isn't just software. The, we're going, on a fundamental shift has been happening for the last, let's call it 20 years or so. Where we're no longer making things from raw materials and assembling them with our hands for the most part. Our entire economy is gonna be shifting to tracking what people are making in their brains, which unfortunately is a little bit more difficult to track than how many pallets of raw goods I have in the warehouse. Um, so as a, as a result, most of the tools are used as enforcers of this messy human process that we have, right? It's, it's gated stop points. Okay, you've worked on that. Now I need you to go back to this tool and I need you to tell me all of the things that you did over here, which is already cataloged in this other tool over there. Um, this is really insane. Uh, we, we, there are a number of uh, uh, particularly enterprise products out there, like a, I don't want to name names, but there are some out there where there are literally full time people full time that all their job is to do is run around and ask people, hey, what's going on? How are things going? And then they go back to the tool and enter what other people told them. <laughs> Courts call these people stenographers. 
Like it's, it's insane. Um, and then this is the other problem that I that I have with mo particularly the low the lower end of the, of the space is that the tools are paradigm specific. Um, what the VP of engineering at Dig when he when he introduced Agile into Dig he was like you need to be agile in your approach to Agile that you need to iteratively implement Agile across across the org right and and that stuck with me it's really smart and I agree with it 100 percent of this day. The problem is, is that when you go and pull that perfect, dogmatic, agile tool off the shelf, you're like, this doesn't look like my agile. It looks like somebody else's agile. So uh, these are some of the problems that I think that are, that are really fundamentally broken in, the, in our tool space. And this is what I think we need to do. We need to move to 100% asynchronous communication. Um, I know it's a little cliche for the engineer to be up here telling you you need to kill meetings, but this is the reality. Um, it particularly because of these reasons. I've been spending, I spent a lot of time, I'm from the Detroit area, so we, we, we uh, you know, we build a lot of crap, uh, and mostly in traditional manufacturing. Um, and I've been, ever since college, I've been really fascinated with production operations management. Uh, and, and I'm really happy to see over the last kind of five to 10 years, we've been, you know, wholesale ripping off uh, methodologies from traditional manufacturing. Kanban and Lean are, are just straight out of Toyota for the most part, right? Um, this is another problem that I'm seeing. Hard to be agile when only 10% of the business is agile, right? Like the developers come in and they're like, we're gonna be agile, and you're like, cool, but I actually have this really crappy waterfall process that happens from marketing to PR to sales to business, so it's like, this is another problem that I see. This is the other thing, us Americans love to think that we're the only people on the planet, but the reality is globalization is real and workers are starting to be spread across regions. So obviously we had a whole conversation about that. It's very, very difficult. I have, uh, I, I worked with a contractor in Australia, for instance, and that's like the perfect, like crappy alignment of time zones, right? There's like two hours, once at like 11 p.m. and once at like 6 a.m. that you can have a conversation with them, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really, it's rough. So. The, we basically need to get over our need to look at people. And I understand this is very anti-agile, by the way, right? Like one of the, I think the very first tick in the Agile Manifesto is like we value in-person communication. That's great, except for the reality of the knowledge-based economy at this point is that you have a designer in the UK, you've got a couple contractors in Belarus, you've got a team here that's working on mobile, and because we all treat, you know, we all treat Android as the bastard stepchild, you've got another dev shop someplace else that's doing that while your iOS hackers are working on that. And in that reality, you can't be like, well, hey guys, we're gonna have the all hands at 11 on Friday. Like, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I wanna leave everybody on this quote. This is really, I think, the most important thing to take away, and I hope you take this away. You can't ship product. I love this quote because a lot of, process. or process, you can't ship process, sorry. You better ship product, yeah. That was an amazing Freudian slip. I'm just gonna leave on that note. I'm gonna pull like a stanza. So does anybody have any, uh, any questions? I think there are two very classic examples for organizations that are that are doing that at scale even beyond 300. Um, the two examples I like to use are both Apple and Facebook. The way that um, Apple in particular structures their teams, highly cross-functional. There's, there's, there's bits of the entire organization in a very small team, and that small team is effectively empowered to build that product. So smaller teams at the edges of the organization empowered to make the decisions that are appropriate for their particular piece of the, of the pie. So I think the extreme example there is the, is the very first version of Safari was programmed by one guy. It was like a team of like three people that shipped actual Safari the first time. 
something that I'm, I'm really impressed with that Zuckerberg has done with, with the way that he structured his organization is he actually has a, a very, it's a very shallow but broad depth of lieutenants that they call product managers there. But the reality is that product manager at Facebook is like a mini CEO. So there's a product manager of Facebook Photos, which also happens to be like 15 times the size of Flickr, right? And basically, if you notice the way Zuckerberg acquires companies, he goes out and finds CEO entrepreneurs that have a, a paradigm, amazing, groundbreaking kind of vision around something that Facebook has, and then he goes and buys them and is like, okay, your Facebook Photos, run. And, and his position with that, obviously, is obviously a lot of money in the bank that he can make these conversations happen with, but he can come to an entrepreneur and like, you have the vision, and I think you have what it takes. What you don't have and I have it is scale. So you can continue working with the small machinery and try to build the machinery around yourself to get your product where it wants to go, or you can come set it on top of my 1.1 billion person platform. Right? So those are the two, I think, shiny examples that I've seen where people are doing things like this, but it also requires an amazing amount of transparency and an amazing amount of trust. Uh, I think I actually had one back there. Oh, just one more question. There was somebody over there. Any other questions? There's... It, 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 we've got multiple, uh, a small team that's supporting multiple products, and if you want to lower the cost of, of failure, then it's hard because you, you, you ship something, but then you need to circle back and fix something that's broken, but already then th that small team has moved on to the next project or product. How do you balance that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I do uh, two very weird things. One, our engineers do customer support. They answer customer support and they fix their broken code. Um, I, the other thing that I do that I, that I, that I always fight for, when, and I always have to fight for whenever I go into an established software shop, is a certain percentage of your time should be dedicated solely to maintenance. That's the other thing. So. Um, you know, we do, at this point, what I've done is, I've kind of taken a, a slightly modified version of that methodology where I basically have uh, a couple of contractors, one on the front end, one on the back end, and they now handle that support maintenance stuff while the rest of my team is moving forward. Because it tends to be kind of a part-time haphazard job, so. Thanks everybody, I appreciate you having me.